Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Clean Tech, a roundup of the week's biggest stories you need to know in climate and clean energy in 15 minutes or less. Today is Friday, January 19th, 2024, at the culmination of a very cold week for most of us in the United States. Um, I'm Renewable Energy World Editor-in-Chief John Ingle. We'll have Kate Yoder from Grist joining us very shortly. But for now, I'm joined by Clean Tech PR veteran Mike Casey of TigerCon. Mike, are you warm? You look like you have a nice sweater on, so I hope so. You know, it was uh, it was a chilly 14 degrees here last night. We don't get that a lot in Virginia, but I'm well. Thanks for asking. And hey, FYI, that last week's Clean Checker of the Week, Scott Kubley, he's agreed to come on our Scaling Clean show to share his lessons from running his company. It's the first time someone will share lessons learned from the ending of his or her company. Hmm. So for all those who found Scott's post inspiring, you'll hear more from him in the weeks ahead. Hats off to Scott for being so courageous and generous with his experience. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that, though I'm in no way associated with that podcast, so you will not use me to promote it. But I I wish you luck, and I'm sure it'll be really interesting. We want to thank all of you listeners and viewers for uh, giving us feedback, sending in those story recommendations, and nominating your Clean Techer of the Week. Do that by sending an email to rew at clarionevents.com, and we'll have that link in the episode description as well. All right, Mike, get us started. Our first story is one written by Nicolas Rivero from the Washington Post titled Winter Storm Test Texas Green Grid Updates. John, what do you think? So there's some irony here, and this story is is good news for renewables and batteries. Meanwhile, we lost our producer a minute before recording this episode, who <laughs> is in Austin because his power is out. So we will not we will not um, you know skate over that point because I do think it's an interesting <laughs> development here. So since winter storm Uri in 2021, I was there in Austin. Um, it was a brutal week and a half. Texas has built more renewables and batteries across the state in the hopes of preventing or shortening the duration of future blackouts. So Texas is now the state with the second most battery power behind California with enough to power one third of Texas's households for one hour. This is three times more than it was in 2021. It also now has 22 gigawatts of solar. I think that's almost all utility scale as well. An increase from the six gigawatts before Yuri and its wind infrastructure has the capacity to generate up to 39 gigawatts of power up from 31 gigawatts. And earlier today, there was a PUC hearing. I think one of the commissioners said solar is now making an impact. Solar is now giving us something that is moving the needle. Um, Mike, what did you think? Well, you know, after Yuri, the gas industry activated its rental units within the Texas state government to blame everyone but the actual culprits. So with the tactical skill of Hunter Biden and the class and diplomacy of Lauren Borbert, uh, they pretended that renewable energy and non-Texans on ERCOT's board were at fault. Of course, it wasn't the frozen gas lines that Texas officials themselves had actually declined to weatherize. Uh, Fast forward to this month, and the build-out of renewables and storage seems to be doing what Texas needed them to do, which is to make the system more flexible and resilient. So perhaps Texas officials can quietly look at energy efficiency measures to further strengthen the grid. They, of course, will not want to tell anyone they're doing that because it would interrupt their preferred narrative. John, story number two. All right, number two comes from the Wall Street Journal and reporter Rochelle Toplensky, titled Octopus Energy Has Texas Size Ambitions. We're staying in the Lone Star State. Mike, what'd you take away? Yeah, I I love this piece. I thought it was really interesting. So Octopus Energy Group is using its renewable energy management system to uh, craft an Uber-like offering for cheaper prices to Texas customers who let the AI-enabled platform manage their energy usage based on how much clean energy is available. And that Uber comparison comes from CEO Greg Jackson. Um, his goal is to make pricing and service uh, changes based on supply and demand at a time and place when they're needed. I think it's really an interesting step forward for clean energy owners and developers. It's um, It's new demand for energy at times that would otherwise uh, be curtailed, and this is going to drive the deployment of clean energy. John, what did you think? Well, we've had um, the CEO of Octopus Energy US, Michael Lee, on the Texas Power podcast before. He's written a couple of times for Renewable Energy World as well. Super smart guy, knows everything there is to know about distributed energy resources. But more specifically, he's hyper-focused on that customer experience, which is a, is a tech world thing that sometimes gets lost, I think, in our business because we're we're so um, focused on the mission and the clean energy and climate, but he wants to make this platform as 
user friendly as possible and something that really engages the customer and makes them want to be involved. So I think what Octopus Energy is doing is is really exciting and um, excited to see how they're paving the way for more DER expansion in Texas as well. They're re- uh, they're involved in a number of those pilots that are being considered by the PUC. So I think that's a sneaky market on the, uh, the behind the meter front that, that has come a long way in the last couple of years and is likely to go even further uh, soon. Mike, what's our third story? It's from Joey Capaletti and John Hanna from the Associated Press. It's called States with Big Climate Goals Strip Local Power to Block Green Projects. John, your thoughts? You're- Your favorite topic, NIMBYs, Mike. Michigan NIMBYs and local officials have derailed more than two dozen utility-scale renewable energy projects since May 2023, leaving some farmers to sell their land rather than benefit from having solar. Michigan and other states are considering giving state authorities the power to decide on the approval or disapproval of locations for those utility-scale projects to build more clean energy infrastructure. And while developers still need to get that local approval for projects, a three-person commission would have the power to override a denied project as long as it meets state criteria. Super interesting here, Mike. Yeah. First, I wish AP editors would stop using the cylinder era terminology in their headlines. But on the substantive level, I think this is a big step toward balancing the importance of local residents' views with statewide needs. Right now, the gas industry is far too empowered to pressure local officials to say no to the job creation the tax revenue and the lower energy prices that clean energy projects can bring to their communities. We should note that leading fossil fuel bro Kevin Martis has already begun a push for a ballot initiative to reverse the state preemption provision in Michigan's law. I'll bet my mortgage that the gas industry will soon be flowing money his way uh, for this effort very soon. John, what's our fourth story? We have a story written by Ivan Penn from the New York Times titled, California has dealt a blow to renewable energy, some businesses say. Mike, what'd you think? Yeah, we talked about this before, but California's utility-inspired decision to gut rooftop solar is doing the damage that we feared. Uh, I think it's safe to say that at least three things are true. First, the damage is accruing and fast. The rates that solar homeowners can charge utilities for the power that they generate has been cut by 75%. Rooftop solar sales down 85 percent, a wave of layoffs, somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people rippling through the industry. Second, Gavin Newsom clearly wants to be president in 2028 or beyond, and he's um, running hard already. He's going to have to wear these results and as, uh, as they are happening on his watch. Third, we need to learn from this disaster. The solar industry walked into a trap that was more telegraphed than Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Everyone saw this coming. Few responded accordingly and at scale. So if you're part of this industry and you weren't working to stop this debacle, you at least own a micro share of the blame. And I'm going to include myself on that list. John, what would you think? Yeah, just some numbers to throw out there. According to SIA, so the the trade group that represents solar and storage, rooftop solar grew about 13% last year, but this year it could decline by 11.5%. That shows you how critical the California market is to rooftop solar. It props up a lot of those other markets where it does, you know, solar doesn't pencil or it doesn't make sense to exclusively be outside of California. And the California Solar and Storage Association adding that it estimates this policy will kill 17,000 jobs. But even stepping back from the, the rooftop solar piece, and it is incredibly detrimental to that piece of our industry, this is showing how challenging it is for states to grapple with high penetrations of daytime solar power at the residential level. The duck curve is not something that we can ignore. I think all sides agreed that something had to change. The NEM 2.0, NEM 1.0 eras were not going to serve the grid needs of today, but I think they got it way wrong with NEM 3.0, and and hopefully there's some kind of intervention down the line. All right, Mike, our last story. It's written by Kate Yoder from Grist, who's going to join us. It's called Companies Are Hiding Their Climate Progress. A new report explains why. Kate, welcome to the show. And uh, boy, this is a really interesting story. You got to tell us, what does green hushing mean? So green hushing is a new trend. And essentially, it means that companies are deliberately hiding their climate goals. So, Kate, give us your your biggest takeaway from this reporting. I have a few thoughts after reading through it, and I thought it was a really interesting piece because people have um, very rich opinions about net zero goals and and how corporations are, are, you know, touting their 
initiatives and efforts to address the climate crisis. But I'll, I'll let you take a stab at it first. Yeah, well, what I thought was really surprising was that according to this new report I wrote about, uh, 70% of sustainability-minded companies were you know, getting secretive about their plans to tackle climate change. And that's such a huge contrast to just a few years ago when it seemed like there were all these splashy corporate promises about cutting corporate emissions everywhere. So what I think is really interesting is that, you know, the survey looked at the reasons why companies were doing this, because this is green hushing is sort of a trend that emerged last year um, for the first time. And essentially, one of the main reasons was because of new regulations that were meant to combat greenwashing. So, you know, in, in this effort to kind of counter false environmental claims, um, these new laws emerged. And then, you know, even companies that are honest about their claims are kind of scared to speak up. Kate, what's the connection between this new phenomenon of green hushing and these attacks on ESG? Well, I think that ESG attacks in general have more uh, more of an impact on asset managers. Um, so that's my understanding, at least. So like last year, you saw BlackRock and Vanguard kind of start hiding or scrubbing references to sustainability from their sites. Yeah, I think the lesson learned here is that uh, pressure tactics from incumbent sectors, they work. That's the reason they do them is because they, they're able to slow down changes that uh, will accelerate the transition rather than uh, hinder it. And they're pretty good about moving resources over to new threats. Is sir, do you get the sense in your reporting that green hushing is a trend that's going to grow and continue? Or do you see it petering out at some point? That's a good question. I think that it's something that we're seeing in some countries more than others, according to this report from South Pole that I wrote about. Um, and they found that actually companies in the U.S. are green hushing the least. And that was mostly because, um, you know, the U.S. just doesn't have as many regulations around environmental claims as in countries like in Europe. So France actually was the country with the most green hushing and the U.S. was the second least um, after Japan. So, Kate, what do you think the result is here just from from this ongoing trend? And if if more companies are being quiet about their sustainability goals and actions, will they continue to make the investments that have propelled renewable energy deployment in this country and around the world? Or will some see it as an opportunity to pull back and say, look, now I'm not under the gun anymore because you all have, have railed against ESG and and net zero targets. So instead of greenwashing, I'm I'm going to do nothing. I think it's going to be some of both. So the interesting thing is that the report found that actually three quarters of, of climate conscious companies were putting more money into net zero goals than before. They just weren't as open or as willing to talk about it. Uh, but some of the consequences could be that, you know, there would be less competition or less pressure on companies to reduce emissions, you know, if they don't know what their competitors are even doing. Um, and, you know, that could be a big deal because a lot of the big corporations around the world don't even have a net zero goal yet. So they haven't even started this work. Well, John, we're just about out of time. Before we wrap, let's go to our clean ticker of the week. Yeah, this week's clean ticker of the week is Helen Sweet, nominated by Connor Gordon from Rondo Energy. Helen makes visitors feel like VIPs when they visit the Rondo office, according to Connor, and masterfully coordinates calendars for many busy members of the company's executive team. So we want to congratulate Helen and thank Connor for the nomination. I want to give a shout out to our ter terrific producer, Brian Mendez, and to Alex Peterson and Claire Quirin for helping us identify this week's top stories. Yeah, hopefully Brian can see this once his power comes back on in Texas. Um, and thanks to Kate for joining us on this episode of This Week in Clean Tech. You can read all of the stories we referenced today, including Kate's in the episode description. Please subscribe, give us feedback, and share your story recommendations. Mike, we'll see you next time. See you next week, my friend. Take care. <laughs>